Hi, and welcome to the five minute check in. Today, we're going to talk about artificial intelligence. Some people call it chat GPT and how this is so much in the media, in the news, and what are some of the implications in healthcare. We're not going to talk about what it's really being looked at right now, which is things around schedule optimization and billing throughput. But we're going to do a little mental exercise on how effective and helpful is chat GPT in diagnostic and therapeutic thinking when presented a case. I want to be very clear. We are not suggesting we use ChatGPT in anything diagnostic or therapeutic. We're not using it here at Common Spirit. This is simply a mental exercise to try to play with ChatGPT a little bit. And I have two special guests who are going to help me with that today. And a little warning, we're going to be a little bit more than five minutes. So let's meet our guests. So we have our two special guests. First, we have Dr. Gary Greenswike, our Chief Executive Physician for the Physician Enterprise and our leader in quality. Gary, thanks for joining us. Tom, thanks for having me. Very nice. And we have back again, Dr. Ankita Sagar, our Vice President for, for uh, Clinical Standards. Ankita, thanks for being here. Lovely to be here. Thanks. So what we're doing today is each one of us picked a case where we had strong evidence for what the diagnosis and therapeutic intervention should be. And we asked ChatGPT first to help us with a case. And then we asked it for the evidence. So we're going to start with uh, Ankita and your case. So Ankita, tell us what your case was and, and, and how that whole process went. Sure. So I picked a case of something primary care teams see often, which is joint pain, right? So I put into the chat prompt that I have a patient who has enlarged joints, they're swollen, they're red, they're tender, worse in the morning. What's the diagnosis, right? Give me the solution. And it did give a solution. It said, you know, this likely diagnosis is rheumatoid arthritis. Um, mm. Then I subsequently started to ask, well, you know, two to four joints are involved. We have an abnormal ESR and the symptoms are less than six weeks all the things that we put into our ACR criteria, so the American College of Rheumatology's criteria. And I asked, well, what is the likelihood that this is rheumatoid arthritis? And quickly, uh, ChatGPT responded by saying, well, it's relatively low, but you should understand there are some caveats uh, to the criteria, mm. but still not naming the criteria that it's using to give you the suggestion." right? Until I finally prompted and said, what is the clinical calculator you are using to diagnose my patient with mm. rheumatoid arthritis? And then it finally said, oh, it is the American College of Rheumatology and the EULAR criteria. So interesting that it's able to give you a possible diagnosis, but it won't back it up with saying this is the clinical criteria that you should use to analyze the patient, nor will it recommend treatment. Hmm. And it didn't didn't explicitly come out and say, well, these are the standard criteria by which we make the diagnosis and things to that effect. So sort of you kind of had to pull it out of them a little bit to say, what was that underneath that? Very interesting. Yes. So we'll come back to that in a second. And uh, Gary, what was your case? And tell us a little bit about your interaction on this. Sure. Uh, so I chose uh, a diagnosis called pheochromocytoma. It's a relatively rare tumor of the adrenal glands. Uh, I'm a primary care physician, and I have seen all of two of these in my career. And uh, But yet it's well known, and I think most of first, second, third year medical students and the like uh, are well familiar with this. So um, there's not a criteria, but there is something called the diagnostic triad which includes uh, rapid heartbeat, sweating, um, headaches, uh, blood pressure can be high or low. So I uh, asked at GBT uh, as a consumer um, and told them that I was having headaches, sweating, rapid heartbeat, and sometimes my blood pressure was high. Could they give me, could chat GBT provide some advice? And so they did. The first advice was, I'm not a doctor, but I can give you some general information. And I do want to say that uh, it, throughout all the questions, it emphasized that chat, BT, chat BT, GPT is not the doctor. Uh, but I, I, I felt uh, a bit disappointed with the first answer, unlike Dr. Sagar, who kind of got to the diagnosis. It just basically said, well, it could be migraines, it could be hypertension, 
could be anxiety or panic attacks. And if your symptoms get worse, you better see someone. So not a lot of specificity. I was putting thinking of putting like a failed stamp on that one. Um, so then I, I thought, well, okay, I'll give it a hint. And I said, well, um, do you think it could be a pheochromocytoma? And then it leaped into action and said, absolutely, yes. Your symptoms you mentioned could potentially uh, be related to a pheochromocytoma. It listed out the triad of headaches, sweating, rapid heartbeat, high blood pressure perfectly, um, and said, uh, remember, I'm not a doctor, but if this gets worse, you need to see someone. Interesting. So, you were able to kind of pull it out of it. but yes, it, definitely. I mean, and it I, is a rare condition. Uh, and um, so it, interesting how you got that. So let me tell you mine, and then maybe we'll have a little discussion. So I presented a young woman with a low probability of having a pulmonary embolus who was in the ER, and I asked uh, you know, chat GPT, you know, what they thought gave the vital signs, normal heart rate, normal pulse ox, clear lungs, but just mild shortness of breath. Uh, and again, chat GPT started by saying, I'm not a doctor. You should, you should really, you know, call a physician to evaluate this patient. I said, I am a doctor. I'm just curious what you think, uh, this might be, and didn't really pulmonary embolism was not in their thinking for this one. They said, well, you may want to rule out asthma. Uh, and eventually I said, well, do you think this could be a pulmonary embolus? And they said, well, there are criteria. And then they kept repeating the background criteria of immobilization was the main focus that they gave me. Was this person flying long distances? And finally, I said, well, do you are you familiar with the Wells criteria? And then it said, yes, this is the Wells criteria. By the Wells criteria, this patient is low probability. So really didn't put into action what is the most highly utilized form of evidence to make a diagnosis of pulmonary embolus until I said to them, use the Wells criteria and tell me what that is. So sort of an interesting interaction. It did use the Wells criteria correctly once I asked it to. Um, so why don't we open this up? I mean, I think I'll start with me. I mean, I think if I had just said, tell me the Wells criteria for the score for this person, I think it might have been helpful. Uh, you know, I mean, Wells criteria is pretty easy to use. And, but, you know, it's nice to know that you have somebody that can chat back to you and potentially write the note. So I thought that might be helpful, but I really didn't find it that helpful presenting the case uh, and having them come with me with a diagnosis. Um, is that, and Ankara, that seems to be true in both of, in both of your cases, right? Ankara, not much yeah. in terms of just pulling out and clearly defining, hey, I'm looking at this evidence to make this yeah. diagnosis. Right. Exactly. Um, you know, I think when when we have to pull it out of ChatGPT to say, this is the clinical criteria you use, I think it, it sort of, in my mind, loses some points because upfront should be the idea, this is the criteria and based on the score, this is the likely or unlikely diagnosis. In a sense, giving a reference almost by saying that, right? Right. right, exactly. Yeah. And Gary, you, you agree with that was sort of your experience. It, it was. Uh, and I, I would say um, uh, you, you have to kind of pull it out of them, <laughs> number one. And maybe it's not fair, but um, uh, that's what we sort of see every day. Um, it didn't really provide any data and, and the recommendations. And I asked it a third question about well, what test do you think I should order if I really want to figure this out? And the, it did the best in that. It listed blood and imaging, genetic testing, glucose testing, all those things, but there's no data, no evidence. Uh, and honestly, all of this information is available in an organized fashion where you don't have to pull it out in other references. A simple one, of course, is up to date. You look up pheochromocytoma and it's all right there and, and, and makes clinical sense. But is it a useful tool? Um, it's helpful. And I, I think that it'll take time for us to figure out how to use it. So interesting discussion. I, I, you know, I, a couple of things I wanted to say right up front. One, we are not using this to help ourselves with diagnostic testing or therapeutic interventions anywhere in common spirits. I just want to be very clear on that. Um, and it's a process of thinking about where might this tool be useful in, in, our, in our diagnostic thinking. And it, it's something we're going to continue to look at. To me, at the end of the day, it's like, where is the base of evidence and the quality of evidence that chat GPT can pull up right? That's what we need to know. And that's the key to the success in this space. So I want to thank both of you for, for playing along with me on these three cases and testing out ChatGPT. And I look forward to further conversations with you. Thanks for joining me.
So thanks for joining us in this very interesting conversation around artificial intelligence. Uh, it's very interesting future ahead and how we might be using this. But thanks for joining us in the five-minute check-in, and I'll see you in two weeks. 